There we go. So you guys, if you could whisper, that would be great. I want to start um, class. So my first announcement is um, I handed back tests on Friday. If you were here, you got it. If you were not here, um, I have them with me. And so I'm happy to give them back to you. Um, if you are a student who just comes um, via Zoom or listens to the recording, I'm very happy for you to come and pick up your test. Um, we just need to make an arrangement for you to physically come and get it. Um, so that is number one. Um, number two, um, we finished up the lesson six on Friday. And so um, that online homework was assigned. Um, it's due this Friday by midnight. <clears throat> I gave some hints as to how to solve um, several of the problems. So if you were not in class on Friday, I would strongly suggest you access the recording, um, at least at the very end, so you can get those hints that I gave. There's a couple you're going to want to draw a Venn diagram for and a couple that you're going to want, um, or probably three, I think, that you're going to want to draw a tree diagram for. Happy to answer any questions on those. Um, if, you know, so please feel free to ask. Um, the other thing, and I'm going to send an email out today um, to the class. The other thing that I want to mention to you is um, the next class activity. I have, I have right here, you can pick it up. Um, cool. I also want to share my screen for everybody on Zoom. Um, so class activity four is now available. So if you want to get it off of um, Moodle, you can now get it off of Moodle. Um, or you can pick up a hard copy from me anytime this week. I want this due on Friday, OK? Um, it, it's not long. And it's don't make it harder than it is because it's not meant to be difficult. So like literally, when I ask how many people blah, 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 all I want you to do is look at the table and write the number, okay? So what this um, next activity is, um, is not meant to be really, really challenging, but it's meant to show you how conditional probability is actually used far more often than people think. So when we talk about medical testing, like, you know, for example, suppose you get tested for a disease, okay? Um, like COVID, for example, you know, uh, no, no test is perfect. There's false positives and there's false negatives, right? So sometimes you might come back with a positive test result and actually not have the disease. And sometimes you might come up with a negative test result when you actually do. So things like false positives and false negatives um, happen a lot in medical testing. Other things like sensitivity and specificity are two other things that are really common um, in the medical world. Like, you know, if a person has a disease, how likely is it that this test is going to pick up the disease? Okay, again, no test is perfect. So really the, the whole point of me doing this um, this worksheet on medical tests is it's all conditional probability. And it's just for you to actually get a taste, you know, like this isn't just some abstract nonsense discussed in a math class, um, but this is something that's used quite frequently. Cool? Awesome. So um, yeah, I will talk about the lesson um, I'll send you an email. So um, worksheet four is due this Friday. 
And um, lesson six, online homework is also due this Friday. And it may feel like, wow, that's a lot for this week. But the beautiful thing about having things due on Friday is it means you don't have to deal with it over the weekend. I'm just trying to like give you a positive. Okay. All right. Are there any questions, comments, any anything that people would like to ask or talk about? Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to mention is yesterday morning before I went, um, I went for an awesome um, up to the beautiful lake. And um, it was very well moving. Um, the colors are so beautiful. Um, you know, the fire beans and then the huckleberries. Anyway, they're all just bright, vibrant red. I just, I love colors. All colors are really something I do. So, um, but anyway, before I went and did that, um, one thing that I do, and a um, faculty member are asked to do it every couple of weeks, and that's send out alerts um, to students if we have any concerns about anything. Um, and one of the due dates, the, the most recent due date was um, today. So I always do it like the day before. Um, you will have gotten an email if I processed an alert for you. And the alerts are processed. So if you didn't get anything, it means that nothing was processed, okay? But if you've got missing online homework, I'll point it out. Even if you did great on the test, if you have missing homework, I will point that out because homework is worth 20% of your test. Um, if you scored low on a test, um, you know, if, if I'm referring you to tutoring for whatever reason, um, these are ways that uh, we as faculty Hey, can you mute yourselves, my friends? Cool. Thanks. Six months. That's probably like oh, six different yes. Josh. We found it. Thanks, Sally, <laughs> for pointing that out. Um, so if there's any concern at all, or I refer you to tutoring, this isn't punitive, like there's no negative effects. It's just that I want everybody in the class to be successful. And if I've seen that there's little bumps happening, even if it's, it is the case that I do drop two online homework assignments and I do drop um, two class activities. But if I see some missing, even at this point, I at least want to mention it to you just kind of as a nudge that those are really the, uh, low stakes ways of, of getting points in the class. And I don't want you to miss out on that opportunity. Okay. So I just want to say that, you know, I do this not to be punitive or anything like that. It's more just because if everyone can take math 115 and get a C or better first time around, like that's the beautiful thing. Cool. Okay. Y'all away. I know, I, 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 I totally feel it. I have a really, really tough time on Monday mornings. I just do. I have an 8.30 meeting every Monday morning and um, I'm just not ready for people yet. I, my weekends are very secluded. So last thing that I wanna mention is um, I did move my office if anyone wants to come. Um, by and see me. I have a note on my old office door saying that I moved. I just actually moved next door, but it's a bigger office. So I've got more room for my plants. I mean, let's like get down to what's really important. <laughs> so um, my new office in case um, you want to drop by is of course here at Missoula College and I'm in um, 420. I live in 421, but Cool. All right. 
So um, I want to jump into lesson seven, but prior to jumping into lesson seven, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions about lesson six. Well, I will take that as a no, but what I will say is if you have not yet started the online homework for lesson six, start it, okay? Um, and I'm happy to answer questions in class tomorrow. I'm happy to answer questions in class on Wednesday as well as on Friday. But I can't answer online homework questions unless people have them to ask. And there was just a chat. Could you go? Um, what I would say, Brie, is it would take me probably half the class to go through the main points in lesson six. Um, we talked about conditional probability um, and reducing our sample space. But we did that in a whole lot of contexts. So we did that in the context of tree diagrams. We did that in the context of uh, Venn diagrams, as well as tables. And um, the other thing that I'll mention is independent events. So if you need like a recap of anything that we've talked about, this is why I have that box folder, okay? So I'm happy to answer questions. I just, um, it would take me half the class today to do an overview of, of lesson six because there was quite a bit there. But what I will refer you to do is go to the class box folder. I have um, the videos, the audios and the notes and I have them labeled by what lesson was discussed. So you can just go through um, chronologically all of the lesson six. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. And I'm sorry that I don't have the, the class time to go through at, um, that section, but I would definitely refer you to, um, to the box folder. That's totally what it's there for. And then as always, I'm happy to schedule something and clarify any further questions that you have. All right. So what I want to say today is we are starting lesson seven. Now, what I want to say about lesson seven is it looks very intimidating, but it's not. Ultimately, what it involves is pushing buttons on a calculator, okay? The key is to know what buttons to push. So I want to at least give you the background scoop of what these things are. And I'm going to motivate the formula that we used to have to do by hand. So gosh, even back when I started teaching here 20 years ago, you had to do a lot of this stuff by hand. We just didn't have handheld calculators that did all these computations for us. Um, but now we do. So it's like, well, why not use what we have, right? Yeah. You're all really quiet today. Is it just the Monday thing? Good. Yes, I love that, Sally. Yes, you do get to put math, push math to buttons. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about what are binomial distributions, what are the unique characteristics of these. I'm going to motivate the formula, but then we're going to get really practical probably tomorrow in class, and I'm going to show you how to do it on the calculator, cool? So the thing that you do need to pay attention to is the language, you know, the at least, at most, no more than, no less than. That's what one of the big things that comes into play here, okay? All right, so 
you use these when, okay? There's three criteria that need to be met in order to um, satisfy a binomial distribution, okay? So one is you use it when an experiment is repeated several times. You use it, number two, and you need to meet all these criteria when there's only two possible outcomes per trial. Remember, a trial is every time you repeat the experiment. They tend to call these success versus failure, but you need to define your success. And I'll, I'll go through a ton of examples, so don't worry about that. And each trial is independent. Remember we talked about independence in class on Friday? You're not going to have to check independence. Um, I promise you for, for the binomial problems, I think that would overcomplicate things. Um, but <clears throat> you'll recall in class on Friday, we came up with that formula with which to check independence. Okay, and the key thing is pertaining to each trial is independent, is that the probabilities do not change with each trial. So what are some examples? How about flipping a fair coin? Oh, by the way, um, in terms of combinations and permutations, we're pretty much done with those for the semester. I don't know if that makes people happy or not. Um, some people don't really like them very much, so I just thought I'd let you know that since we don't have cumulative finals in here, we're pretty much done with those. So maybe that'll make some people smile a little bit. Anyway, flipping a fair coin is a classic example of a binomial distribution. Okay, why? Because you can flip it many times, right? You can repeat that experiment. Literally here, there's only two possible outcomes, heads or tails. And each trial is independent. Again, we're assuming it's a fair coin. So what your coin lands on on one flip is independent as to what happens on the next one. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, one that might not be as obvious, but it will be very soon, is rolling a fair die. And let me explain. So this can be repeated multiple times. You can keep rolling a die. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. If it's a six-sided die, there's more than two possible outcomes. But you can define what your success is. So for example, maybe I'll define my success to be rolling a one. And then would you grant me that there's only two possible outcomes? You either roll a one or you don't roll a one. Does that make sense? Okay. And again, if it's a fair die, presumably each trial is independent. In other words, the probability of rolling a one or not rolling a one isn't going to change. Okay. Um, suppose you're told that a vaccine is found to be 95% effective. I claim this is a situation in which we would use binomial distributions to compute these, okay? Why? Well, each time you give the vaccine to somebody that's considered an experiment, you can give the vaccine many times. 
There's only two possible outcomes, either it's effective or it's not effective. And presumably whether or not the vaccine is effective for one person is independent as to whether or not it's effective for another person. Okay, so these are all some really classic examples of um, binomial distributions. One big hint that I'll give you is when you're given a general percent, you want to think, ah, that's going to be binomial, okay? Because this is the probability it's effective. You're just given that straight up. Are there any questions this far? All right. Now, you might be asking, well, so what more is involved? Okay, well, um, what I'm going to do is walk you through an example of how this actually is more involved than meets the eye. It's kind of, and the reason why I mentioned that we're pretty much done with combinations and permutations is this is kind of like the last day I'll be talking about combinations, and you won't even have to use them here because you've got this handy dandy here. Okay. So let me just walk you through an example of why there's more than meets the eye, okay? But this is a pretty chill example we can start with. So let's suppose we have a fair six-sided die and it's rolled five times. First thing I want us to do is find the probability of getting exactly five ones. And you can either write this part down or not write this part down as the case may be. You're gonna learn a shortcut soon enough but I don't like to just show you things without explaining why it works this way. So tell me something. What is the probability if you have a fair six-sided die of rolling a one? Don't think too hard, it's Monday. This is a total Monday morning question. One out of six, good, okay? Right? There's six possibilities and there's one way to roll a one. So what is the probability of not rolling a one? Good. Five out of six. Okay. Again, there's five possibilities of not rolling a one. You could get a two, three, four, five, or six. All right. <laughs> Do you agree that we're doing this five times? So I'm going to say my n value is five. That's the number of times we're performing this experiment. And what a thrilling experiment it is. Okay. Well, on our first roll, what's the probability of rolling a one? One six. How about my next roll? This is independent, my friends. What's the probability of rolling a one on my second roll? One six, no, one six. right? The probabilities don't change. How about on my third roll? One six, right on. You're loosening up now. How about my fourth roll? Awesome and million dollar question, one six. So do you agree that the probability of getting exactly five ones is one six raised to the fifth power? And we could compute that or not as the case may be. You know, after we've gone through such complicated ways of computing probabilities, isn't it something how hard it is to go back to like these more basic questions? You're like, okay, where's the trick? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna change this scenario slightly. Now 
let's find the probability of rolling exactly four ones. This was a straight up example that we could just go through, right? Didn't change. It didn't change from um, trial to trial. So I claim there's more than meets the eye because now not only do we need the probability of each trial, but we also need to consider all the ways it can happen. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I'm doing this experiment five times, there's a lot of different ways I can roll a one, right? We want it to happen exactly four times. When it happened every time, there was no variation of when the one would happen. It happened each time. But now, couldn't we roll a one, roll a one, roll a one, roll a one, and then roll something else? And we just got exactly four ones. Or we could roll a one, roll a one, roll a one, get something else, and then roll a one. Or we could roll a one, roll a one, get something else, roll a one, and roll a one. Or we could roll a one, get something else, and then get three ones. Notice I'm looking at all the different ways that we can get exactly four ones. Or we could roll something else and then get four ones right in a row. You with me there? Okay. No matter which one of these rows I'm looking at, we know that the probability of rolling a one is one sixth. Okay. And how many times is that happening? Four times. So notice here when we wanted it to happen five times, we had one six to the fifth. Now we have one six to the fourth. But what's the probability of not rolling a one? That's five six. So we need that to happen one time. But how many different cases are there? How many different ways could we roll exactly four ones? Aren't there five different ways this could happen? Okay. So what I want to say is we're still doing this experiment five times. How many ones did we want to get? Four. And I claim that the way you would compute that is five choose four. Okay, so your N value is the number of times the experiment is done. And this X value is the number of quote unquote successes we want. And we're defining a success to be um, rolling a one. So this is the last of the combinations that you're going to be seeing. And I claim if you compute five, choose four, you're gonna get five, I promise you. All right, so do you see how once we made it just a slightly bit more complicated, computing the probabilities got a lot funkier and finding the number of ways things could happen got a lot funkier. So this motivates <clears throat> what we call binomial probability. Now I'm going to show you the formula motivated from here, 
but I claim that this is not a formula that you're ever going to use. Um, and one of the ways I always know who comes to class and who doesn't come to class is how they solve binomial problems on tests because people who don't come to class tend to do it the really, really, really hard way. And uh, anyway, because that's like what the book shows. So please don't make life harder for yourself. It's my goal to make life easier for you. Okay. So P is going to be the probability of success. So will you grant me that one minus P then is the probability of what we'll call failure, right? Because the sum of all probabilities is one, right? And if there's only two possible outcomes, it's P and then one minus P. So this will make you appreciate technology a lot, okay? Moving forward. So this is the old formula. So for N independent trials, notice <clears throat> we already say that they're independent. With X successes, and therefore N minus X failures. The probability is N choose X, P to the X, one minus P to the N minus X. Now, if this formula looks crazy bad to you, you don't have to use it. If anything, it's just gonna make you appreciate the advances in technology but I wanna show you where this comes from, okay? Notice here, we were rolling the die five times and we wanted exactly four ones. So my N is five and my X is four. My probability of rolling a one or my success was one sixth. And we want that to happen four times. Notice these numbers match down here, X and X. And then one minus P, in other words, when it doesn't happen for those other times. Notice here, my exponents add up to my N value, okay? So this is the way that we used to have to compute these things. What you need to be able to walk away from in order to solve this using technology is you need to be able to identify what your N value is, and that's the number of trials. Like now we're getting like into what you gotta do, okay? You need to know what your P value is. That's the probability of success. Again, if it's a coin or a die, you know how to find that probability. If it's like a vaccine or some drug, they'll tell you what percentage effectiveness it is, okay? Once you see a percent binomial, I want to be kind of like a knee-jerk reaction thought for you, okay? And the final thing you need to be able to identify is what your X value is. So that's the number of successes we are... I'll put wanting in quotes because maybe we don't want any of this. <laughs> All right. So what's a classic example of a uh, binomial distribution? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down an example and have us practice finding the N, P, and X. I claim if you can find the N, the P, and the X, you're pretty much all the way there, okay? And then what I'll say is tomorrow, um, I will bring both the TI-8384 calculator as well as this calculator, and I'll show you how to push the buttons because that is something that you have to be able to do, okay? I'll show you where to find the binomial stuff. So suppose I tell you that the newest medication
was found to be 85% effective. In a trial of 250 participants, Maybe we want to find the probability that exactly 200 people found it to be effective. Okay, <clears throat> so we're not gonna do any computations yet, but I am gonna show you all the variations of what you're going to see. But from this, I just want us to be able to identify what is our N, what is our P and what is our X, okay? And again, I'm trying to build this up slowly. Tomorrow we'll actually do computations, okay? What is my N in this example? What's the total number of people that we're giving? We're giving it to 250 people. Beautiful. What is the probability of success? And let's just assume success means it's effective. Well, the probability how likely is this medication to be effective? Isn't it 85% effective? Change it to a decimal. Your calculator won't let you put it in in percent form. Remember, P is the probability of success. And we're told that in general, it's 85% effective. It doesn't change, right? This is an independent um, experiment. And in this case, what do we want to find the probability of? How many successes? Good, 200. Guys, there's only three numbers given to us, right? Process of elimination. Do you see how I got the 250, the 0.85, and the 200 from what I have here? Okay, don't look too deep. There's not much deep here. It's more just a matter of remembering what does your N represent? That's the total number of times you do the experiment. That's the total number of people here. Here you're told, you need to be told your X value because if you're asked to find the probability of a success, you have to know how many successes you want. And then if a percentage is given to you, you just need to change it to decimal form. In our previous example, we knew the probability of a success, which was rolling a one, because we've played with dice before. Now, notice in this case, we wanted to find the probability that exactly 200 people found it to be effective, okay? But <clears throat> these things can be worded in a lot of different ways. And I'm right now showing you all the ways that these things can be worded so that you're ready, okay? You can be asked to find exactly X successes, which is exactly, the, sorry for the redundancy, which is exactly what we just had in the previous um, example, right? We wanted exactly four ones or we want exactly 200 people to find it to be effective. We might be in the situation where you want to find at most X successes. What does at most X mean? Doesn't it mean zero through X? Right? If, if, 
at most five is five or less, and it can go down to zero. I could have at least X successes. And these hints that I'm writing down here are meant to be very helpful. They'll help guide you in the homework, I promise. Well, what does at least X successes mean? Doesn't that mean X or more? I could have no more than X successes. And that I claim has me go from zero to one less than X, because I'm not counting X here. And finally, no less than X successes means X plus one onward. I pretty much stick on tests to these three. You're gonna see these in your online homework. Okay. So I'm just gonna summarize one more thing and then we're gonna jump into playing with this tomorrow. I'll recap this stuff. Okay, I don't expect that you won't think about other things between now and then. What time is it? Okay, cool. So in practice, my friends, N is the number of trials. P is the probability of success. And X is the number of successes. We're gonna come back to this part tomorrow, but here's what I wanna say. When you're using a calculator, if you wanna find the probability of exactly X successes, and I'll show you how to get there tomorrow, you're going to use the binomial PDF function. And you're going to have to enter them in these values, N, P, and X, precisely in this order. P stands for point. And we wanted it exactly one point. That's why it's binomial PDF. If you want to find at most X successes, that's where you go from zero through X. Be thankful, you know, like if you want at most 200 successes prior, we would have to do binomial PDFs 201 times, right? Because that means zero or one or two or three or four or five, okay? Fortunately, we have these wonderful calculators. Binomial CDF is the function that you use there. C stands for cumulative. And finally, if you want at least X successes, well, your calculator can do the at most, but it can't do at least, okay? But if I want at least X successes, doesn't that mean X or more? Isn't this what I'm interested in? So this is an example where we're gonna use the complement. What is the complement of X or more? Isn't it X minus one or less? Right, if I want at least five successes, isn't the complement of at least five, four or fewer? So the way that you do this one is you find the probability of the complement which is binome CDF 
n p x minus one, and then you take the complement of it. So it's one minus. Now, right now, this probably looks like meaningless gibberish to you. Okay. Can, can you give us what the P and the N stand for again? Yeah, the P and the N are right here. And these are the key. If you take nothing else away from class today, take away this. Now, if this is funky, don't even sweat it one iota. I promise you, we are going to go through more examples than you're ever gonna wanna see. And you're gonna see that it's just a matter of pushing buttons in the box, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is um, if anyone wants a physical copy of this worksheet, I'm gonna hand it out in class. I'll be bringing them all week. It is available on Moodle as I showed you at the start of class. And, um, and uh, if anyone's here who didn't get their test back, I would love to give that to you. All right, see you tomorrow.